My name is Christina Pascucci. I'm a reporter and anchor at KTLA, about to anchor the show today. I am from the Valley. I'm a Valley girl, <laughs> Calabasas, Woodland Hills, grew up all in that area. Um, and I just, I love life. I love people who have heart. And that's why I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to talk to you, Ed. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Christina. Well, speaking of that, so I picked up, uh, I, as I tend to do when I do a podcast, I'll do a little bit of research. I, I don't want to do too much because I don't want to make the interview feel like it's scripted even though I do have a couple, you know, you're in, in the industry, you know what scripted is, obviously. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's kind of cool that we're getting you right before you go on the air at 11 o'clock too. So you wrote a blog entry in, in January of this year that says, my intent is to humanize every story to find the heart of it. Needless to say, that resonated with me. Can you talk about yeah. that a little bit? Talk about maybe are there stories out there that jump out to you when you first think of finding the heart of a story? Where does your mind go? Well, I think that's the essence of why I do what I do. The whole point in being a reporter is not to deliver negative news. It's yeah. to find the humanity in the story. So if I am happy, if, if I do happen to cover something negative, like a murder or, you know, something where a family's experiencing tragedy, I at least want to humanize it. So it's not just another statistic, but people understand that this was someone's son. This was, you know, maybe create some sense around, um, what happened, even though it's senseless so that people can understand, you know, like context and um, what led to this, who was involved, like how a real family is impacted. And I think that that can give the family some solace. You know, I never want to be one of those reporters who says, oh, how do you feel about this yeah. tragedy? Because yeah. that to me just makes me cringe, but more like, you know, what's the message that you want to get out there? What do you want people to know about your loved one? So that's in those, those sad things. Then there's like these moments of triumph where you have, um, you know, one of my favorite stories of all time was when I, because I'm a pilot, I got a chance mm -hmm. to fly this World War II era pilot for her final flight before yeah. he passed. And I wasn't allowed to share at the time because of, you know, HIPAA and everything, but she was on hospice. She was going, she was going to die within a matter of months. And this was her wish, like to get up in the air one more time. And so I think when you can take two people who are completely different backgrounds, you know, Bev was the name of this um, pilot. She was a WASP, Women Air Force Service pilot yeah. during World War II, um, really a pioneer for women everywhere. And so I think when you can connect two people from such drastically different backgrounds and then have them come together in this beautiful moment where it's just like, there was so much heart. We, we embraced after I cried. <laughs> she was, you know, like during that flight, she was just like so joyous. And if not that, then why are we here? You gave her a gift that not many people could give. And that's pretty cool. I love when, yeah, just to your point, when two people who seemingly don't have a whole lot in common find that common denominator. And can, yeah. I think we're all as humanity, it's all about connection. Yes. And she gave me such a gift. And, you know, um, we all have something in common, even if it yeah. doesn't seem like we do or opposite ends of the political spectrum or whatever it might be, you can always find a common denominator, even if it's just the fact that we all want to feel love or yeah. be understood or, or whatever it might be. Yeah. Okay. So the why, since that's where we're going to live in this conversation, I have a feeling I like it. it's why <laughs> it's why you do what you do and why I do what I do. So let's just live there for a little while. Um, I will do an introduction that people will have already heard by the time they get to this part of the interview, talk about some of the things that you do, your accomplishments and background and so forth. I'd like to just start with the why on, for example, you talked about pilot, for example. Mm -hmm. So you've been a pilot, you're in your mid thirties. There's not a lot of female pilots your age. I'm sure they're out there. And by the way, happy women's internet, international women's day today. This was yes, our, thank our you. Doing this today. So I think that's really, really cool that I'm interviewing Appreciate this amazing woman on international women's day. So Oh, so you're a pilot. Let's, let's start there. How did that start? Your, I took pilot. I took like 20 hours of flying lessons when I was 18. And oh, cool. Decided to invest my money into other things and college and girls and all those other things. Maybe at some <laughs> point go back. Things. Yeah, other other things that were important, of course, but yeah. travel as well. Lots of travel. But Ooh, uh, why? How did that start for you? I was around 24, and I was definitely afraid of small planes and heights. And I remember I, I was single and I was uh, working in Palm Springs and this guy took me on a date to Big Bear in his plane to go have lunch. And it was kind of the first moment 
before I thought of it, I almost had a reframe in my brain, like, oh, wow, this is a great opportunity to face my fear. Mm-hmm. And it's really awesome. Yeah, it's also <laughs> like, pretty cool. You know, the freedom to just fly to Big Bear. Yeah. And so I um, kind of started as like, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna try this out. And so at first it was just almost a test to see if I would get a little bit less scared each time. And then I made it into a whole segment for the Palm Springs station I was working for, KMIR. And it was called On Air and In the Air with Christina Pascucci. Hmm. And because viewers were coming along, they were winning a free flight lesson every week so they could face their fear too, right along with me. I had no choice but to complete that pilot's license. So um, I did it all the way through to when I soloed. And they got to see like the first time I was up in the air with no one else in the plane, which was really frightening and (laughs) vulnerable to put that on TV because like, God forbid, I totally, I don't know. (laughs) You don't want to become the story. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I did that. And then kind of like you, I, it was just, it was expensive and there was other places to put the money. I mean, I wasn't making very much money, especially to support getting a pilot's license because it's around 10 grand. Yeah. And, and so I put a pause on it and then I picked it up again when I moved to LA and had saved a little bit more money toward that. So I would say, you know, within like five years after that initial time, um, I got serious and mm-hmm. I got my certificate. Yeah. So no pun intended, talk about the high of flying that small plane. I know what I felt when I did it and it's more than 30 years ago. So it's been a little while, but for yeah. you to talk about it, because I've, I've followed you, I've seen you on your news stories and I've read your blog and I've, you know, we've been communicating through this process. I think we, this has been an interview that's been about a year in the making <laughs> from our conversations yeah, and texts exactly. and so forth. So I know a thing or two about why but i'd be curious just that feeling you get when you're piloting a plane there's nothing like it truly i mean i it's appropriate to talk about this on international women's day because i think a lot of women doubt themselves you know like that's a part that's that's really the only thing separating why there's more men than women i think is men tend to be a little bit more confident in certain things and their ability to for example fly an aircraft and women um, tend to be a lot more, have a lot more self-doubt. So for me, every time I fly and I'm in that plane alone without anyone else assisting me, it is an added proof that like, wow, you really can do this and you are capable and you should have faith in yourself because you're freaking flying a plane. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. No kidding. You are completely in control. Yeah. And so it was just a huge sense of accomplishment and freedom and liberation. And every time you're in the sky, you feel so at peace because you're focused. You're not checking your phone. You're just Mm -hmm. fully there and present and, you know, taking it all in. Yeah. If you're not present, you're not going to do it twice, right? (laughs) Yeah. They say you don't have to be great at parachuting to do it once, but you got to be really great at it and do it twice. It's the same with flying a plane. (laughs) So let's touch on International Women's Day for a minute again, not in the, the quote unquote script, because again, we just talked about this. Let's take a moment, if you don't mind, to honor a woman or two in your life that you admire, maybe a mentor or someone that in the past or or currently, you talked about yeah. them, obviously the, the pilot, but someone that you met for a story, I'm guessing there hasn't been a lot of history prior and she's since passed, but others in your life that have inspired you that you'd like to honor today. There's so many. Yeah, where do we start, right? Picture this morning of, my quasi bridal shower, which is real small since it was during the pandemic. And we took all these precautions, blah, 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 to make it happen. But, you know, my bridesmaids threw me something and I was looking at each and every one of them. And you're really a reflection of your friends and and the people closest to you. And a lot of them are very different, but they're also accomplished and like, just, they really inspire me. You know, they do all different things. One, Um, one of them has been my best friend since we were 12. Her name is Jade and she is this amazing performer and she's an actress that has her own show that's doing really well, which in and of itself is, you know, a miracle in the acting world and so much talent and openness and, and freedom of expression through her. And then I have other friends who, um, have just worked up the totem, the totem pole to now be executives at their firms or, or whatever, you know, it's just like, I love seeing these women create and manifest their dreams. And then there's my sisters, my, my blood sisters who are um, 20 and 15 years older than me who have really inspired my journey as a reporter. And there's my mama who mm-hmm. is an immigrant and barely spoke English when she got here. 
and had, you know, was a single mom with two, two girls early on in her time in, in Los Angeles. And, uh, she's so strong. So I, you know, I think anywhere I look, even here at KTLA, a lot of my cohorts too, they're, they're all doing their own nonprofits or doing things to help the community. And I love to see that. And, and I really appreciate the men who celebrate us too. Yeah. Well, it's amazing. The obstacles that, that you have overcome. My mom was a director of the Women's Opportunity Center at UC Irvine for a lot of years and my formidable you know, early teen and late teen years. And so I got to see what people can accomplish when the obstacles are removed. And it's yeah. pretty cool. Pretty cool. And so I, I admire you for what you're doing and the examples that you're setting. You touched a little bit about some of your cohorts at KTLA that are involved in nonprofits. And you can't talk about Christina without talking about philanthropy. For example, I know that a couple of years ago, you were the, the um, LA Catholic Big Sister of the Year. Mike Trueblood, who's a close friend of mine, was honored with you on the, on the yeah. male side that night, I believe. I took over for Mike in my current job at Cal State Fullerton. So I met him. About oh my him gosh, what a ago. small world. Yeah, he's an amazing man. He was National Big Brother of the Year back in, I think, 2011 or 12. Oh my gosh, he's incredible. Yeah, he's done some yeah. good things. So how'd you get yeah, involved I, in that? Um, Yeah, I, I honestly, that year... We, I'm almost speechless because I, I won California big sister of the year and there are 10,000 bigs. And it's like, how did, how did I get chosen for that? I feel like everyone's equally amazing. Um, so I, I got involved initially when I was in Palm Springs working as a reporter out there and I just wanted to give back. And I wanted to, I wanted to hang out with like-minded people who are also giving back. So a friend told me about big brothers, big sisters, and uh, once I got involved and I, I realized and saw the impact, I couldn't turn back. I was like, I'm all in. And I'm still close to that little, um, well, she's not little anymore now. She's in <laughs> yeah. her early 20s. But the young girl who I met in Palm Springs now, it was 10 years ago at least, wow. um, 15 years ago. Oh my gosh, crazy. But yeah, so. Um, yeah, I know I the statistics really are most people only stay engaged for a year to 18 months. And so I think that's one of the reasons why. And I've talked to some of the people there. So I know why you are honored, by the way. But, um, you know, yeah, the <laughs> fact that, you. You, that, that stick to it. Well, not just for this interview, but I mean, I'm intrigued by it as well because of Mike. And I've attended other Big Brother, Big Sisters events. And the Orange County uh, director for a while was a good friend of mine. And she's moved into another foundation now. But, um, yeah. So, okay. So you've done a lot of really, really, really cool things. And we could, for time's sake, I want to jump to some of the highlights. Interviewing the Dalai Lama. I know you've been asked this before and I, I try <laughs> not to ask the same questions that you've been asked a million times, but I can't no, talk to you like, without hearing that story. Yeah. Well, I interviewed him twice and yeah. the first time was a result really of having an incredible executive producer here at KTLA who was thinking of the big picture. And there was a story in Anaheim with these kids committing 1 million acts of kindness. Mm. And the Dalai Lama's personal emissary for peace, Lama Tenzin, who is now a dear friend, he was going to be there and support this initiative. And so I was like, that's so cool. You know, if this is supported by the Dalai Lama and like, let's report on something good for once. And so um, she let me and a lot of producers would be like, oh, maybe we'll have that as, you know, like a quick story. We don't need a reporter on it or whatever, but she let me do this whole thing. So when I did it, I, I went out and I met Lama Tenzin and he ended up um, helping me coordinate, I guess, uh, Dolly, I like to call him Dolly. That's I cool. guess the Dalai Lama saw the story of, of the kindness and he loved it. And so Lama Tenzin helped to set up an interview for his 80th birthday in Orange County, which he was celebrating there. Um, I think it was at UC Irvine and then that went great. And so then we set up an interview to, to interview him in his palace in Dharamsala. So yeah. that was pretty cool going to India yeah. for PLA. And, uh, it was, I, it was funny cause I got really, really sick the day before and I got my first sty ever. So oh. I was like, I had a swollen great timing. Shot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it rains, it pours. It was yeah, just exactly. like. It was such, such funny timing, but, um, you know, it was incredible and we were there and he was, has this childlike wonder and humor. My cameraman was so nervous. Hmm. And so we tried miking him and Dolly could see that my cameraman was nervous. So he kind of looks at him with these mischievous eyes and then he grabs my cameraman's beard and shakes it. 
Hmm. And he said, when people take themselves too seriously, I like to lighten them up. <laughs> nice. He has that, yeah. uh, that laugh. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. That's so cool. Uh, That's got to be a highlight to think back. And you know, how many people get that opportunity, let alone to go to his palace? <laughs> I mean, that alone, awkward. people wait hours just to shake his hand and you're sitting there in his office in the palace interviewing him. That's pretty amazing. Sitting And then sitting there amongst all the Tibetan monks as yeah. they did their chance it was pretty surreal yeah i knew that's where you were going to so i'm not going to sit here and even for a minute think that we have much in common but i do have a heart for a lot of the things that you do and that's one of the reasons why i'm drawn to interviewing you but there's one area where we have nothing in common talk to me about talk to me about sharks they scare the hell out of me <laughs> but you swim with sharks you love sharks you you are an advocate for sharks tell me how that love started and 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 why why sharks? You well, probably sharks like snakes and... too, right? No, no okay, snakes. Good. I don't good. think snakes and sharks are comparable. No. Sharks to me, to me yeah. are the guardians of our ocean. They are what keep our ocean clean and running. And, you know, they're an apex predator and they, um, they basically clean it up. And they have been the target of illegal shark finning. And when shark finning well, it's not, I don't think it's legal everywhere, but it should be. And it's when a fisherman will just take off the top fin for, you know, whatever they use it for vitamins or whatever, or any delicacy shark fin soup in China is really right. a big thing. And then they just let the shark fall to the bottom of the ocean and suffer and die. And it's so sad and their numbers were depleted. And, um, it's, it's just something that I felt passionately about because when I, I'm a diver and I love diving when I'm down there with them. They're just these majestic, beautiful creatures. It's not, I, I even think the maker of Jaws, one of the top people involved said that they really regretted doing that because mm. of how it made people fear sharks and then yeah. disrespect them consequence, as a consequence. And um, they're just, I feel like they're misunderstood. And so sometimes I feel like I can relate to them. Yeah, that's awesome. Do you ever, ever give a fear when you're down there at all? I mean, uh, early on maybe, or has that subsided or? Oh, heck yes. There can yeah. be a fear because at the end of the day, they are wild animals and anything's possible. And so you have to have like a reverence for and respect for them, but also like a healthy fear, I think. Um, so, you know, like one dream of mine is to go diving at Tiger Beach in the Bahamas and dive with tiger sharks. There have been very few incidents, if like any, but it's still always something that is a possibility because yeah. you just, you know, even with a dog, any sort of animal, anything sure. could ever happen. So you just kind of got to watch your back, know what to do if they start to get more aggressive and kind of prepare that way. So you sort of touched on it right there where I was going to go next and, and whether it's Tiger Beach in the Bahamas or, or whatever it is, what's that? Not so much the big story. I know as a journalist, you're always thinking of what's that big story. You hope you get that yeah. opportunity. <laughs> is there that big hairy audacious goal or that white elephant that you're after or just the next big thing for christina that you'd like to do in your life there are two big things i really want to summit mount everest and mm. i really 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 want to go to space no, in the oh, worst way thing. that's right yeah i read about that yes that's cool. can we make this happen ed well you know what we'll i i don't know if i know anybody but certainly we'll put it out there we'll we'll Pull certainly make the string. request there you go i yeah. know a few people at jpl yeah <laughs> yeah so, that would be so cool i just think did that start when the pilot thing started or where did the space? I've always interest? loved space. Yeah. yeah. I think at some point when I was a kid, I thought it'd be cool to be an astronaut and then I went a different path, but you know, I think we can always reinvent ourselves. I don't know how you feel about this, but I, I think it's good every 10 years or so almost to just totally change careers or I've done it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's what this, thing called life is all about is trying and experiencing and experimenting with as many things as possible. Yeah. That's At why podcast. I mean, the podcasting for me, I don't have any big goals of this turning into anything other than just you're my 58th interview in a year. So a little over a year, so about one a week. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's less about the fact that it's number 58 and, and it's all about who I get to talk to. And I get 58 hours roughly so far of amazing conversations with very intriguing people. And mm. I've been doing that my whole life. Now I'm just recording it and sharing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it used to be just private. And you're special and, you know, too. I mean, well, you clearly have the heart and. Um, I have the last property. name anyway. Right. So <laughs> it suits you. I just love people. 
I just, I absolutely love people and I love hearing people's stories and getting an opportunity to, to be an avenue to have those sherry, those, those stories shared. I can talk. And I think that's why you do what you do as well. So I was going to ask you, what do you love most about your job? I mean, yeah, you get to jet set off to different places and that's great, but knowing you, I get, that's not what you, yeah, you love that aspect of it, but yeah. you don't love it because of that. What's the big, because why you love being a journalist? No, there's so much. I mean, it's the continual learning, meeting someone new. I mean, I've interviewed thousands of people at yeah. this point. And I just, I I think it's almost, uh, it's a, the school of life. You know, you just get to learn something new every day, experience something new, become an expert in something very quickly. You can become adaptable, um, teaches you so many things to to deal with what life throws at you, you know, when you have personal tragedy or things that strike you in your own life, you're, you're better prepared because of this, <laughs> because of this crazy job with these yeah. crazy hours and that just can throw you into anything, any moment's notice, like, you know, one second you're covering a cooking festival and the next you're going to a fire All or, right, yeah. you know, covering an earthquake, God forbid, or, you know, just like any number of things or interviewing a world leader. It's, it's, uh, to me, a ticket out to the world. Tell me about the earthquake in Mexico city. I know the little girl story touches me. I'd love to hear that. Have you share that story? Um, oh my gosh, there was so much from that. That was an exhausting, like four days or so that we were there. Um, we, I got the text like, Hey, Christina, can you go to Mexico? I think in part they picked me because I speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it was, uh, Yo también was, hablo español. Oh, entonces, <laughs> we can do all things Spanish now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think, I didn't know exactly what to expect. And what struck me so much was after this huge tragedy where there were many people who had died, there were, there were people in Mexico City lined up in the road, like cooking meals, selling water, or even giving it away just to kind of look out for their fellow man and woman. And that was so cool to me. And uh, we got there and there was, the, the story we covered right away was there was a school that had been, you know, reduced to rubble and there were some kids believed to be trapped under there. And so we were kind of covering the play-by-play -play as and, and the frantic search to get them out. And um, so we interviewed some of the people. I don't know if you're talking about that one or, or the woman who thought her daughter was stuck in a different office I building. I think there was a little girl at a school that thought that she had lost all of her friends. And, yes, yeah. yes. So we interviewed her and her mom and, you know, she didn't know she had her little like, I think teddy bear or some sort of stuffed animal with her. And just that image is pressed into your brain forever. Yeah. And yeah, she didn't know when she was trying to digest what this even meant, if she really lost her friends, if she didn't, there was so much, you know, fear and uncertainty. And um, we were just trying to give some like whatever comfort we could, however we could help. And that was the spirit everyone kind of felt and embraced there. You had volunteers coming from all over the world. It was so crazy to see. It's so cool. Your faith comes out, and I don't mean your your religious faith, but your faith inside comes out in so much of what you do in these stories. Talk about how your faith drives you. This isn't a faith-based podcast, but it always ends up going there. Sometimes I take it there like I'm doing now. Sometimes the guest yeah. does, but I know it's important to you. I'd love to hear about how that drives you and the things that you do. Well, I think um, like leading with love becomes really important, you know, and it's easy to forget that sometimes, or if you're on deadline and you're frustrated or whatever, but I think to always go back to that place of like, peace and presence and um, leading with just heart is is always what saves me at the end of the day. Yeah. So I try to insert that into every story because otherwise you're just kind of part of this machine that perpetuates fear. And the whole reason I got into journalism was because I wanted to change that. Yeah. And I think KTLA does a pretty good job of doing community stories and trying to not go to the fear portion. Yeah, I definitely appreciate that about about your station and what you guys do. It seems like everyone, I know a few people there as well, and we won't name drop right now, but certainly I see that in, <laughs> in the on-camera folks and some of the behind the scenes people that I've met over the years as well there at KTLA. Yeah. What do you say, um, well, what would you say is your legacy? I know we're, we're getting close to when you have to go on the air here. So 
This yeah. is, I need another hour with you. Hopefully we'll have a part two and we can dive. I know. I would love things. that. Yeah, I would love too. that. But so how do you want to like, be remembered, whether it's journalist or philanthropist or just woman leader or wh wherever you want to go with that? What's what's the legacy you're searching for? Yeah. Um, you know, do you I don't even think about legacy. Some people don't even think about it. They just live and then we'll, we'll worry about the legacy later. I ask people that question all the time. And so it's interesting to have that thrown back at me. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, I have been thinking about my legacy for a long time. And that's part of the reason why I have my faith drive me because I just want to make sure that whatever I'm doing, I'm serving the world in the greatest possible way that I'm meant to. And so I, I want my legacy to, and I'll think about this maybe for part two, I'll have it solid okay. down, but I want okay. my legacy to be someone who um, upheld, you know, journalism in a way that wasn't biased, that truly presented both sides without inserting my own opinion, someone that people trust and um, just really, you know, like a, a, a force in journalism that, that upheld that trust and that people felt they could go to um, for their news and, and also to bring heart to it in humanity. So in the honor of, of the day that we're on today, and I do plan on putting this interview up today um, because I, I'm a big believer. Let's get these out there. Let's get this fresh, and yes. especially since do it's it. International Women's Day. Yeah. Whether it's the little girl who has doubts because maybe she's being raised in a home where she's being told that she can't do things or the woman who maybe is in a home where she feels stifled or whoever you want to talk to right now, if you could just give a message to that woman of hope, what would be what would be that message and how would you share it? And then I'll have one or two more questions and we'll wrap up. Yeah. Oh man. Just to like love yourself and trust in yourself and be, be soft with yourself. Women can be so hard on themselves, myself included. I am my biggest critic. And sometimes, you know, like I just need to give myself a hug. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And so just, yeah. you know, like trust in that and, um, and trust that, that you're doing the best that you can in every any given moment. And that's all you can really ever ask yourself for. And also I want my legacy to be the first reporter on the moon. There you go. All right. Well, we're going to make that happen. We're going to, we're yeah. going to pull some strings here, Christine. I don't yes, know what the, where and when those it. strings are, but boy, I'm going to, there you go. I'm going to get you to the moon, to the moon, Alice. Yeah. I say, right? how, do, how do people reach you? I reached you pretty easily, but how do, if, you know, for more about on you, the social mediums, uh, Instagram, at Christina yeah. Pascucci, um where else where else uh twitter would work uh do, 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 at christina ktla they can email me christina.pascucci at ktla.com all right so kind of going back to the quote where we started and i'm going to lead into my last question by this quote from that same blog entry in january just a couple of months ago you wrote the overriding point is that you don't have to be you don't have to sensationalize or grab the attention of viewers. The humanity of the story speaks volumes. I love that because that that's that's who you are. I just want us to see each other, you know, not from behind a keyboard or a screen, but really to like see the heart of one another and know that we are all doing the best we can under our current circumstances, and and that's it. You know, it's um, it's easy to, I don't know, get road rage or yeah. get impatient with someone or jump to annoyance first before compassion. But like, let's give one another the same compassion we want for ourselves on our worst day. Yeah. So my last question is redundant. And this has probably been the fastest 30 minutes of my life. I mean, this has gone. I can't <laughs> believe it's 10 till and you got to go. I know you got to get on the air. But because the name of the podcast is from the heart, which isn't just my last, it's my last name, but it is the whole purpose for why I'm doing what I'm doing. Every interview I've done, I've asked this last question and I'm going to tee it up this way. You've already touched on it a lot, but I want to get in the moment right now. Christina Pascucci, what's in your heart? Oh, um, just a whole lot of love and gratitude and appreciation for this moment and for you know, I'm coming to you from KTLA right now. So even this place, this was where I dreamed of working one day when I was 10 years old watching the morning show. And so it's pretty surreal to be being here, to be here now having this conversation. 
um, yeah, love, compassion, appreciation. <laughs>